Kingsley Williams, Satrix CIO, over to you. Great, thank you very much, Simon, and uh, a very warm welcome to, to all of your listeners. It's a, it's a privilege to be with you this evening. Thank you for taking the time to, to listen to me. Uh, I hope what I have to share with you will be interesting and educational and uh, helps you in your investment journey. So I'm going to kick off just with a, a little bit of an update on, on the Satrix business. Uh, maybe you are familiar with Satrix. Maybe you're familiar with our products, but not necessarily familiar with the business. I'll talk a little bit about the range of offerings we have. Maybe you're familiar with one or two of our uh, ETFs uh, or, or some of our other products, but not sure how the different range fits together. Uh, and there is some method to that madness. Uh, and, then, and then we'll talk a little bit about industry trends. Um, some technical details on the difference between unit trusts and ETFs, uh, how Satrix goes about tracking, uh, and finally some technical dividend issues that uh, can be something to keep in mind when investing offshore. Right, so uh, starting with the Satrix business firstly, uh, Satrix is the largest index investment manager in South Africa. Our genesis was back in 2000 with the launch of the first exchange traded fund on the JSE, the Satrix 40 ETF. Um, and that kicked off the Satrix business and the Satrix brand uh, 20 plus years ago. And it's grown tremendously. It's been an absolutely phenomenal journey. You can see that we now manage in excess of 170 billion rands. Uh, that's our assets under management. That's what AUM stands for. And there's a wide range of different portfolios that we manage, some 150 odd uh, across segregated mandates. Those would typically be for institutional clients, pension funds and the like. A wide range of ETFs, um, a, a, a comprehensive range of unit trusts, and these would be, these would be the typical instruments that uh, retail investors uh, would utilize to invest through. Uh, life pool funds are also typically for institutional investors and USITs are offshore collective investment schemes. Um, so that those you would need to invest in hard currency. You can also see that we track about 45 different indices, uh, lots of different strategies across those 150 portfolios. And then on the right, uh, Simon provided a very kind introduction in terms of the awards that we won at the SALTA Awards. The SALTA stands for South African Listed Tracker Awards. And every year it's an opportunity for the ETF industry uh, to get together and celebrate some of the successes that we've had over over the last year but also looking back even further than that from a variety of different metrics whether it's uh, assets raised uh, best performance uh, most efficient tracking and the list goes on uh, one thing we're extremely proud of and very grateful for is the ongoing support that our investors and clients have expressed in our funds uh, voting the Satrix 40 ETF, the first ETF on the JSC, as the People's Choice Award for their favorite investment uh, for six years in a row. So since the SALTA Awards started in 2018, Satrix has scooped that award by popular vote uh, six years in a row. So that's a, a brief summary of our business and the scale of our business. It's a very large business. It services both uh, retail investors, direct retail investors, it services uh, financial advisors through uh, investment platforms such as LISPs, or we, we know them as LISPs, and then we have a very big book uh, where we service institutional clients. So a very diversified and broad business investing both locally and offshore. This is just a picture of uh, us at the last uh, SALTA Award, uh, the, the one we had a little bit earlier this year, uh, with, with some of the, the awards that we scooped that evening, and these are some of the members of the Satrix team. This just gives you a, a view of our assets under management through time since uh, since 2014, the end of 2014. The number at the top of each bar represents uh, billions of rands under management. And then we've just split it into different types of investment strategies that we manage. So by vanilla, we mean market cap weighted indices, something like the top 40 index or the all share index. Domestic vanilla would be locally uh, based strategies that are weighted in using that methodology. Uh, and that's typically what investors would refer to as passive, but that'll be the last time you hear me say the word passive. Um, and I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, domestic factor are strategies that uh, are non-market cap weighted and typically target factors which are sources of uh, 
risk premia are typically rewarded with additional returns in excess of what the broad market offers. Uh, international is a very rapidly growing part of our book, um, and you can see that in yellow and how that has grown through time. And then we also put all of our different building block strategies together to form multi-asset solutions or balanced funds, and you can see that there's been very healthy growth in that space as well. I'm not going to show you who the team is, just very briefly, that's, that's who we are. Um, this is not the entire Satrix team. Uh, we do have a Manco and Ops uh, and Finance team as well, which supports the business and services our direct retail platform, the Satrix Now platform. Uh, but this is the investment team which looks after the portfolios and some of the strategies that I'm going to be talking about this evening. Right, so let's get into what we offer in, from an investment capability perspective. So I mentioned I'm not going to mention passive again, and make, well, this will be the last slide that I use the term passive, but there's often this uh, dichotomy that gets uh, put forward in the market around you're either investing actively or you're investing passively, and it's a, it's a binary decision, and it's one or the other. Now, Satrix has never really subscribed to that philosophy or distinction, um, and the reason for that is because we actually see investments operating along a spectrum. So on the left, we've got vanilla index funds. These offer beta exposure to segments of the market or broad, broad market exposure. And as I mentioned earlier, this tends to be market cap weighted. So what I mean by that is that every share or company that's included in the index or in the portfolio is weighted according to its market cap, which is very simply just the number of shares in issue multiplied by its price. And that, uh, that determines the weight or the size of each company within the portfolio. And in this space, you'll typically find very competitive cost structures, quite low turnover, um, and a highly transparent and quite simple rule in terms of how those indices are constructed. It's, it's very clear what the largest company should be, and, and similarly, what the smallest companies would be, because it's purely a function of their shares, number of shares in issue multiplied by their by the price of each company. Uh, and this is what investors would historically mean or typically mean when they refer to passive investing. They're referring to these vanilla index funds or these vanilla tracking funds or vanilla ETFs. And these give you market performance very cost effectively. But in the middle, we have what we call refined beta. So what's interesting about this is that it's still a very systematic strategy. It's rules-based in the way that the index is constructed. It offers cost advantages and cost efficiency with low expense ratios. It's also transparent because it's rules-based. It's not based on a portfolio manager's judgment or conviction on which companies they should be investing in and which they should be avoiding. Um, and very importantly, they give you a high degree of style consistency. So, for example, you know, a type of strategy that you might find in the space would be a value index. So it's an index, but it's giving you exposure to value or cheaper companies. So in other words, the companies that are in that index are not selected or weighted based on market cap as they would be under vanilla index funds. They're selected and weighted based on whether they're exhibiting uh, value characteristics. For example, a low price to book or a low price to earnings ratio. And the beauty of these types of strategies, which operate in this refined beta non-vanilla index fund space, is that they are also able to beat the market. So with vanilla index funds, you get market performance very cost effectively. With non-vanilla index funds, you get the potential to outperform the market. But obviously there's no guarantees of that. Like with any actively managed strategy, there's no guarantees that it will outperform, but the opportunity to outperform does exist. And then on the right, you have your actively managed funds. As you can see, there's actually a, a spectrum of choice. And what you would find in the index tracking space is actually a lot more nuanced than this historical dichotomy between active and passive. Uh, there can be very active, in quote, active type strategies in the non-vanilla index fund space, uh, but still run on a rules-based uh, basis. But within the active space, your decisions are gonna be based on conviction and research, typically more expensive funds, uh, because a portfolio manager typically wants to keep their cards close to the chest so that they can e exercise their views in the portfolio, you'll, find, you'll, you'll often not be sure how they're positioning the fund at any given point in time, and hence the reason we say it's less transparent. Uh, 
And also what you'll find with actively managed funds typically is that often you'll get the style of exposure that you that, that fund offers varying through time. So a rules-based fund gives you that consistency of always being, say, a value strategy or always offering exposure to momentum or quality. But an active manager is going to look for where they can find the opportunities. And while they might, might subscribe to a value investment philosophy, they may deviate from that from time to time. And the analogy we like to make is it's a little bit uh, like the food you eat and hence the little icons at the top right of each pane. So if we go back to vanilla index funds, this is your staple. This is your, your starch, your staple ingredients that would go into any meal. In this case, some, uh, some spaghetti, but it could, be, it could be some mealy meal, it could be some rice. Um, in the middle, because it's refined beta and it's a more sophisticated portfolio, think of it more as a well-balanced home-cooked meal. It's transparent. You know, what's exact, you, you know exactly what's gone into it, uh, but it's more well-rounded. It offers more ingredients and more elements of uh, the different food groups that you'd want to consume. And then on the right, you've got a gourmet meal or some sushi that you would typically buy from a restaurant. And I, you, you can just think about, without taking the analogy too far, you would want to get something that's differentiated when you're investing in a more expensive actively managed fund. You'd want to get something that you couldn't do yourself uh, or, or, or have complete transparency of knowing what's in there. Uh, because think about going to a restaurant and paying for a meal, paying a premium price for a meal for something that you could either prepare at home or do a better job at home. You'd be a little bit disappointed. So you want to get something that's differentiated and which can't actually be harnessed in a systematic way. And so we think this is how the industry is going to shape up over time, where active managed funds, uh, where historically some have been uh, guilty or uh, investors have been critical that those active managed funds give you a lot of beta exposure. And I think with the refinement of what beta offers and the fact that you can get that very cost effectively, there will be more pressure on actively managed funds to offer something unique and differentiated. So this is how our range of funds fit together now that I've painted that landscape. So I'm going to move from left to right in this taxonomy, which is just a way of thinking about how different strategies fit together. What I'm listing on the slides are the different uh, indices that we track. So you'll see the name here, uh, FTSE JSE All Share, that's an All Share index we track. And in the bottom right corner of each block, uh, I indicate whether that's in a unit trust uh, or in an ETF. So if it's an ETF, I will list the actual ETF ticker. So for example, we track the FTSE JSC capped all share index in an ETF form, its ticker is STX cap. And then in some cases we track uh, a particular index like the Aussie 40 with the both the Satrix 40 ETF, STX 40, as well as in a unit trust form. So this just gives you an idea of the range of products that Satrix offers. So in the equity space, these are the different indices we track uh, covering the broad market uh, at the top here. Uh, the large cap shares in, the, in these uh, all Z40 and Swix40 variants, and then some uh, we, we also track mid caps in unit trust form. Uh, we also offer niche sector exposure, uh, whether that's the industrials, financials, resources, or property, listed property. Uh, and then in the interest bearing space, uh, a couple of variants there, the all bond index in unit trust form. Uh, we've got an ETF that tracks the government uh, bond indices, STX Gov. Uh, there's an inflation-linked bond uh, government index that we track um, called STX ILB, and then there's also a money market in unit trust form. So these would all be domestic vanilla strategies that Satrix offers. But as I mentioned, we also offer non-vanilla strategies, and that's what you'll find here on the right. So all of these are lumped underneath a factor categor uh, categorization. In other words, they offer exposure to risk premia, which over the long term have shown to deliver excess returns versus the broad market. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on those, uh, but this is just to give you an idea of the types of different building blocks that we offer. And you'll notice here, multi-factor actually combines some of these different factor premiums, such as value, momentum, and quality into a single fund uh, to cre you know, create a, a smoother journey in achieving those excess returns. Also in the non-vanilla space, there's a, a growing uh, demand for thematic-based strategies. And we've created our thematic strategies to speak to megatrends. And I'll, I'm not gonna to spend too much time speaking about that. That's a presentation in its own right. But megatrends are just long-term shifts that are influencing the global economy and, and 
no doubt the you know the global uh, global markets. So one of those which we've got locally is our inclusion and diversity ETF, which speaks to demographics and social change. Quite a topical issue in South Africa, but it takes various forms depending on where you are in the world. Now, if we move globally, you'll see the indices we track here are different. So MSCI World is a very popular index in that space. We offer it in both uh, ETF, unit trust, and offshore usage form. We can offer emerging markets in unit uh, in usage form and uh, this emerging markets IMI index, which we track in ETF form, as well as S&P 500, MSCI China, and India. So these are all vanilla strategies on the global side. Uh, real assets is an interesting one. Infrastructure, uh, listed infrastructure. I think in the environment we're living in at the moment with high inflation um, and uh, clients looking for uh, you know, some sort of protection in their equity strategies. They might not want to be exposed to the big tech names and excessive, uh, expensive stocks, uh, that w which the tech companies largely are. This creates quite a defensive play, but it's still in the equity space um, and offers, you know, meaningful yields as well, uh, as well as a long-term protection against inflation. And then interest bearing uh, is our Bloomberg Global Aggregate, which is the global investment grade universe, which doesn't include South Africa since South Africa is no longer investment grade. And then uh, I'm just going to move on from there and just show you the different mega trends and the thematic funds, which are shown here on the left uh, in this column, and which of those thematic funds offer exposure to the different mega trends. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go through those now but happy to answer any questions at the end, uh, or feel free to reach out to us or to Simon uh, if you need any more information on that. All right, so let's speak a little bit about trends in indexation. What's happening in the global investment landscape and what do we see specifically within the indexation industry? So what this chart shows you uh, to the end of 2021, it takes a while for these numbers to be updated, uh, is the share of assets that are run according or managed according to a rules-based or in other words an indexed-based approach versus a traditional active approach and you can see the growing share of assets in light blue uh, which now make up 31 percent of global assets are now managed according to some form of index or rules-based investment strategy and that has grown significantly over the last decade perhaps to see it a little bit clearer if you have a look at the flows on a year-on-year -year basis, the light blue indicates the flows going into rules-based or index strategies across the globe, whereas the dark blue bars represent the flows going into traditional active funds. And you can see the high degree of consistency with which flows are moving into rules-based or indexed strategies. Some years, there are good flows into active, as was the case in 2021. But in some years, they were actually outflows from active, yet they were still positive flows into, into rules-based or index strategies. And so over this period, 57% of flows, net flows, have gone into index, uh, indexation strategies, showing the, the demand that clients uh, are expressing in terms of what they're investing in and increasingly adopting rules-based or systematic and index strategies into their portfolios. Locally, we're seeing the same thing, and uh, this is the adoption of indexation strategies within the South African market across both the retail market, which would be CIS in both unit trust and e exchange traded fund form, as well as in the institutional market, which would be life pooled and segregated. And you can see the rapid growth we've seen over the last few years with the, with the indexation market in South Africa making up uh, uh, 446 billion rands in assets under management at the end of 2021. This is some work that we've done. And uh, what we've done is looked at all of the listed, uh, all of the categories, the ASISA categories that have exposure to JSE listed instruments, whether those be equities or listed property. And then what we've done is we've said, okay, across the unit trust and the ETF, uh, across both unit trusts and ETFs, what percentage of the listed investment universe uh, and the various equity categories, equity and um, listed property categories, what percentage of that market is made up of rules-based or index strategies? So if you add up unit trusts as well as ETFs, you get to 
of the total uh, AUM uh, in in listed uh, JSC listed instruments or categories associated with JSC listed instruments. So this gives you an indication that there's been pretty healthy ta uh, take up uh, in South Africa with investors adopting index based and cost effective strategies uh, to get their exposure to various uh, various strategies that they want in their portfolio. Within within the rule space, so in other words, within this section here, uh, I've split it out further into what's non-vanilla and what's vanilla. And so you'll see vanilla do dominates, so getting beta exposure to either the broad market or some subset thereof, basically something that's market cap weighted. You can see that makes up basically three quarters of the rules-based assets, but there is a healthy portion of non-vanilla uh, strategies, index strategies that makes up the indexed uh, landscape in South Africa. And these would be some of those factor strategies that I showed you earlier in our local taxonomy, as well as thematic funds. Something else that I find quite interesting, just in terms of a trend that we're observing in South Africa, if we look at multi-asset or balanced funds in, in the high equity category, so it's the ASISA South African multi-asset high equity category, uh, this is where many investment advisors deploy their clients' money. Uh, they, they go into these balanced funds. So this is one of the largest categories uh, in the unit trust space. And what, what we've done is shown the industry overall, which is the green and the red. And this shows you the, the flows on a rolling 12 month basis into this category. And then what we've also done is split it out by the largest 10 funds that make up this category and they dominate the assets in this category. As you can see, the flows into those largest 10 funds uh, pretty much explains most of the shape that you're seeing for the category overall. But then we've also identified what are the rules-based or indexed balanced funds in the South African multi-asset high equity category. Um, and you can see the growing share of flows and more consistent flows, particularly over this period where there were net outflows from this category. It was actually the period that coincided with the largest inflows into rules-based or indexed balanced funds. And in fact, over the last 12 months, 50% of flows have gone into rules-based or index balance funds, even though they only make up about 7% of the assets in this, in this multi-asset high equity category. So I think that speaks a lot to the growing adoption and the demand for cost-effective systematic strategies for clients to invest through. All right, so uh, this just shows you uh, some growing uh, take up of ETFs, which you can now access on list platforms. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that, but very, very healthy demand. Investors increasingly investing in ETFs via list platforms, which Satrix has pioneered to make available. <clears throat> and then if we look globally, this just shows you where we expect demand. This is based on uh, some work done by the Boston Consulting Group, where they expect uh, most flows to go over the next few years. And you can see it's dominated by uh, equity ETFs, fixed income ETFs, other passive equity strategies, passive fixed income. These would be within mutual funds, for example, or segregated mandates. All of the lower fee, which is indicated here by the x-axis, uh, the lower fee strategies are typically where the most flows are going, which is typically in the indexed or rules-based balanced funds, uh, rules-based space. So that's, that's uh, certainly where, where the forces are lying at the moment. And then if we zone in on Europe, which is arguably a more similar market to, to our own, uh, the expectations are that, uh, you know, currently as at the end of 2020, there was about a 20% uh, take up rate of rules-based or indexed strategies across mutual uh, index mutual funds and ETFs. Uh, and that was expected to grow to 25%. Uh, by 2025, uh, with about $4 trillion of dollars under management. And the reasons for that are clear. Fee pressure, uh, clients focusing on outcomes and solutions rather than specific products, um, a, a great demand for increased transparency in what they're exposed to and consistency of exposure or style to those particular strategies, and the benefits that ETFs offer, such as convenience, high degrees of transparency, very efficient to access from a cost perspective, and a very wide range of choice to choose from to harness your particular investment strategy.
also if we have a look at performance on a global basis this is relative to MSCI world so give me a minute to just explain how this slide works what I'm showing you are the 1,500 to 3,000 funds that operate within the global equity large cap category. This is a morning star category. So there are about 3,000 funds at the end of this period that are operating in this category. And MSCI World or MSCI World tracking funds also operate in this category. And so what we've done is plotted all the returns of those funds relative to MSCI World, which is the zero line here on a rolling three year basis. Um, we've also deducted 30 basis points off of MSCI World, so that off, off the index returns to give you an indication of a net of fees uh, return experience by tracking MSCI World over this long period of time. And what's quite interesting is how consistently MSCI World gives you top quartile returns. So just to explain the different shaded areas here, top quartile performers will be where, <clears throat> where the dark blue shaded area meets the light blue shaded area. Top decile is the top of this uh, light blue shaded area. Um, and so you can see if you're tracking MSCI World, you are consistently on a rolling three year basis outperforming your median actively managed fund or the median fund within, within these 3,000 funds within this category. So now, when faced with a decision on which of 3,000 funds to invest in, well, that becomes an almost impossible task because some of those funds are going to, uh, uh, a big majority of those funds. Are going to be underperforming MSCI World. So it just makes a whole lot of sense just to very cost effectively track MSCI World. And this will be some of the underpin and reason why we're seeing such healthy flows going to index based products. If we look at our local MSCI World equity index feeder fund, uh, which is a unit trust, uh, what you see is quite an interesting thing how consistently or how often this fund ranks within the top half or the top quartile of performers within. The global equity uh, category and as you expand that rolling window from one year to three years to five years the consistency of outperformance versus the median fund median would be you know at the at the at the top half or at the where the top and the bottom half meet you're never in the bottom half and in fact you're in the top quartile more than half of the time 55 percent of the time so just speaks to the very compelling uh, compelling performance that you get by tracking a product linked to MSCI World. So this then leaves us with the question to invest in a unit trust or an ETF. So what are some of the considerations? So allow me to take you through this slide to explain the mechanics of what the differences are between a unit trust and an ETF. So just sorry, forgive the, the heading here, ignore the segregated part, but I'm just going to focus on unit trust and ETF. So both both uh, vehicles in a South African context are what we call collective investment schemes and are regulated by the FSCA. So they're both regulated investment products which are suitable for end investors to access and invest in. The big difference though is a unit trust, you purchase and uh, sell units directly with the issuer of that unit trust, the management company. Whereas an ETF, you will buy and sell shares on, on an exchange. And that has important differences in terms of how they work. So let me start here with the unit trust at the bottom. So obviously both funds have got management fees. They both have audit and trustee fees. They're both going to incur custody costs in order to hold the assets uh, at, you know, in safekeeping at a bank. But you'll notice here that here's where one of the differences arises. So a unit trust has what we call a transfer agent or a liability administrator. And their job is to keep a record of which of the end investors uh, own what portion of this total fund. So what share of this fund do each of these end investors own? And that transfer agent is gonna facilitate the purchasing and the selling of, of units when these investors uh, look to invest or disinvest from this fund. Another very important difference is that when these investors look to invest in the fund, they give the management company and ultimately the investment manager of the fund uh, actual cash. And the investment manager is going to have to purchase underlying securities, which is represented by the suitcase. That's the portfolio. The investment manager is going to purchase underlying securities with the cash that these investors deposit. Or if there are net withdrawals, the investment manager is going to have to sell these underlying securities to pay those, those investors out. And these flows are happening on a daily basis. So every day, if the flows are large enough, 
the investment manager, the portfolio manager is going to have to trade underlying securities to keep the fund fully invested. And that generates costs every time there are net flows in or out of the fund that the portfolio manager has to trade for. So those flow costs contribute to the transaction costs in the fund and ultimately impact what we call the total investment charge of the portfolio, which is the management fee, which makes up your total expense ratio, plus your transaction costs gives you your total investment charge. So those flow costs sit inside the fund. <clears throat> now an ETF is a little bit different because uh, firstly, it doesn't have a transfer agent. And the reason for that is because uh, the liability administration is done via the exchange mechanism. So because the ETF trades on the exchange, the books and records of who owns what shares in that ETF is taken care of by the broker and the straight central uh, depository mechanism that exists on the exchange. So immediately on a, excuse me, <coughs> on a on a like for like basis, uh, you you know there's there's one uh, significant cost that is not have which doesn't have to be borne by an ETF which a unit trust has to bear. So on a like for like basis, we say that you should typically find an exchange traded fund is more cost effective uh, from a TR perspective relative to its equivalent unit trust. But that's not the full picture. Um, that very mechanism, which uh, enables you to buy and sell ETF shares on an exchange, um, also ensures that when investors come and go in and out of an ETF, uh, the investment manager doesn't actually have to buy underlying shares to do that. Why? Because these share, these investors in the ETF are buying and selling shares from each other. And some of the uh, participants that are buying and selling shares or providing those shares to other investors are what we call a market maker, but they're also operating in the secondary market. And it's only when that market maker runs out of inventory that they will then come and, come and approach the issuer of the ETF and say, I need more ETF shares because there's more demand out there. And to get more ETF shares, the market maker will deliver a basket of shares which make up the ETF in exchange for the ETF issuer giving that market maker a new allocation of ETF shares. And so, the effect of that is that the ETF itself doesn't have to buy new shares, underlying shares to grow or sell underlying shares to shrink based on supply and demand. It's taken care of far more efficiently with the market maker creating and redeeming by delivering a basket of shares to the fund. Now, the market maker is, is not a charity. Uh, they don't do it for free. They incur costs to purchase that underlying basket of shares and deliver it to the fund in exchange for uh, ETF, uh, ETF shares. Um, and, 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 and in order for their efforts, they, they, put, a, they put a spread on it. So, so they, and, and that's how the market maker makes their revenue. But of course, they're not the only liquidity provider in the market. Anyone else, you, when you're buying your ETF shares, you might be buying from someone else who happens to be selling. So they're just there as the liquidity provider of last resort. But the point is that when investors come and go buy and sell, uh, shares in an ETF, they're not depositing cash into the actual fund. And as such, the fund never has to buy and sell shares to grow or shrink. And as such, it never incurs transaction costs when it grows or shrinks. Those transaction costs essentially sit outside of the fund and are incurred by the investors who happen to be buying and selling at a point in time. But once you're in an ETF, you're ring fenced from those ongoing transaction costs or what I've called flow costs here. That's unlike a unit trust, which will you will be exposed to those ongoing transaction costs as investors come and go in and out of a unit trust. So I hope that makes sense. And just to illustrate the difference in cost structures, what I've done is had a look at the SA equity uh, general equity, uh, the, the, the active funds within the SA equity general category, the, these are unit trusts, and looked at what the median total expense ratio is, sitting at around in excess of 1.2%, what the median transaction costs are, sitting at around the 30 basis points level. And if you add those two together, uh, looking at what the median total investment charge is, which is sitting at around 1.6, 1.7%. So that's the, you know, if you rank all of the costs within the unit trust uh, equity space, local equity space, your median fund, your 50th percentile fund has uh, got a cost structure of about 1.7% for retail investors. <clears throat> 
Now, if you compare that to a unit trust tracking the top 40 index, uh, you'll see that the total expense ratio there for our unit trust is uh, between 40 and about, around 50 basis points. Um, transaction costs are a bit lower, less than 20 basis points. And you add the two together, you're sitting at about 70 basis points. So this unit trust tracking the top 40 index is 60% more cost effective from a total investment charge perspective than uh, an actively managed uh, unit trust. Now, if you have a look at an ETF, then the picture really becomes dramatic. So our Satrix 40 ETF has a 10 basis point total expense ratio, very low transaction costs, to my point earlier, because it doesn't have to incur all those ongoing transaction costs because of cash coming in and out of the fund that gets dealt with through the market maker. And so you're sitting with a very low total investment charge of less than 20 basis points, which is 80% more cost effective than your median uh, general equity uh, actively managed uh, unit trust. Um, and uh, you know, there's the, you, you, you'll also see that the transaction costs are 71% more cost effective or 71% lower than the transaction costs on, on, on our unit trust tracking the same index simply because of the way flows are dealt with. And we see actually a very similar picture. I'm not going to go through it all now, just in the interest of time. Uh, if we look at a global investment offering, uh, if you compare active versus an index fund tracking MSCI world, you see the same sort of trend where your ETF is incredibly cost effective for the various features that I've mentioned. A, the ETF doesn't need a transfer agent or a liability administrator, so its TER can be lower. And B, it doesn't incur those ongoing transaction costs, and so the total investment charge is also lower. So the question is, um, and, 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 and there has been some questions around uh, ETF spreads. So what drives ETF spreads? Well, it's quite a dynamic space, and, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, there will always be a spread because there's a cost to get in or get out of an ETF. And that cost that investors pay to get in or get out is the very cost that protects investors who are already in an ETF from incurring those ongoing transaction costs. So with a unit trust, you don't incur any spread to get in. You buy and you sell at NAV. Uh, but for the privilege of getting in and out of a unit trust at NAV, you, you incur ongoing transaction costs as other investors come and go. With an ETF, you pay once to get in, and then once you're in, you're ring-fenced from, oops, I've just lost power. Hopefully the lights will come back on in a second. Just give me a moment. Um, just want to give that a second. You can still see you. Simon, you're I little... assume you can still hear me? Yeah, we can hear and see you. There you, we go. There we go. Lights are back. Perfect. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Um, so, uh, yeah, the uh, what I was saying is that, uh, you know, once you're in the ETF, you're, you're ring-fenced from those ongoing costs. So you pay once to get in, and once you're in, you're not going to be subjected to any of those ongoing transaction costs as other investors come and go. So, so what are some of the factors that influence those ETF spreads? Well, firstly, like any highly, uh, you know, regulate or not not regulated but highly efficient market uh, it's it's uh, you know like a like a public exchange an efficient market it's going to hinge on supply and demand so the more active investors are within a particular vehicle uh, the tighter those spreads are likely to be uh, the more liquidity there is in an, in a particular etf the tighter those spreads are likely to be uh, but there are other factors that also influence um, etf spreads i mean ultimately it comes down to competition the more competition there is on different investors buying and selling a particular ETF, you would expect those spreads to become narrower. Um, a big factor that also is going to influence the spreads is what the underlying spreads, or what the spreads are on the underlying instruments. So if you're holding a very illiquid basket, which has got very wide spreads on the underlying shares, well, that is going to be reflected in the spreads that you see on the ETF because it's ultimately exposed to those, those underlying uh, stocks which a market maker will have to buy and sell and incur those costs and spreads uh, to, to, to deliver or redeem shares in and out of an ETF. Similarly, there could be different cost structures when transacting on those underlying instruments. 
uh, and the higher those are, the higher those costs will be uh, for the market maker to deliver a basket of shares to the ETF. And then particularly what's relevant in the global context is, you know, South Africa might be open for business and trading on a particular day, but maybe the ETF that, that, uh, that you know, that global ETF, the markets that it's exposed to, maybe a big portion of those markets are closed on a particular day that the JSC is open. Uh, and so a market maker would need to find suitable proxies to value what those underlying shares are worth, even though the, the actual instruments themselves are not trading on that particular day. And so the, the, the spreads of the ETF would adjust accordingly based on how suitable those proxies are and how much tracking error exists on those proxies versus the underlying shares. So very simply, what is a spread? It's basically just dividing the ask price by the bid price and converting it to a percentage, which is why you minus one. That'll give you a percentage, and that's essentially a measure of the of the gap between uh, the offer price or the ask price and the bid price, and expressing it as a percentage of the bid price. And I mean, we we've done quite extensive work looking at our spreads. Um, we've got an independent uh, professor who does best execution analysis, looking at every intraday trade that occurs over the JSC, say over the last three years, and comparing our trades uh, on the spreads on our ETFs versus all of the other ETFs in the market. And there are lots of different metrics that can be used. It becomes quite a scientific and involved exercise to do that. Uh, and I don't want to get into all of the deep stats and nuances. What I thought I would show you is a, a summary of a couple of headline ETFs tracking a couple of different indices. Um, versus some of our, uh, you know, some of the other ETFs and some of the other ETF issuers uh, that operate in, in that same sort of segment. So that's what you can see on this slide. Uh, I'm just showing you the names of our ETFs, identifying those. So, you know, if we're talking about ETFs that track the top 40 index, you can see the STX 40 uh, is not the lowest spreads, but it's certainly not uh, very far away from the lowest. It's, it's quite competitive with the, with the ETF that has the lowest spreads. And this is looking at all of the trades um, from Bloomberg over the last year, um, as at you know up to the beginning of May. So it's literally hot off the press. Similarly, if you look at our global equity uh, ETF tracking MSCI World, again, not the lowest, but certainly not the highest. There are some ETFs that operate in our market offering global equity exposure that have significantly higher spreads. Similarly, our Satrix, 40, uh, sorry, our S&P 500 ETF uh, is basically uh, you know at in the median in terms of the spreads that you would incur and if we look at global technology ETFs or uh, ETFs uh, which would be similar to our Nasdaq ETF for example uh, we're also you know competitive in terms of the spreads we offer uh, and these are the realized stats over the last year according to Bloomberg all right so so that's a little bit on spreads and market access I see uh, we've taken about 45 minutes I'm going to quickly run through how Satrix tracks, maybe just give you some insights into that and then wrap up on withholding tax. So very quickly, there are two different ways that you can track. Uh, well, there are actually three, three ways, but I'm only gonna talk about physical tracking and within physical tracking, what I mean by that is that you're actually holding the instruments that make up your ETF or your index fund. You're not using synthetic or derivative instruments to get that exposure. You're actually buying and selling the actual instruments that make up that index. So within the ETF context, you typically full replication, you hold each and every share that makes up the index. Uh, but where you find ETFs are more broadly diversified uh, and hold, have quite a long tail of very small shares, you might use optimization. More relevant in the global context, um, where you're not gonna hold each and every share in the 1600 share universe of MSCI world, you can afford to not hold some of those very, very small shares down at the tail but you can still get a very low tracking error and track the index very, uh, very efficiently using an optimized approach. Um, one of the questions we often get from clients is, well, you know, why is there tracking error between my fund and the index? So some of the reasons for that would be, well, there could be intrinsic tracking error. So a, a, a portfolio uh, always holds a bit of cash uh, and to the extent it's optimized, it's not gonna look exactly like the index. Uh, but even if it did, even if your shares looked exactly like the index, you might hold a bit of cash in a real world portfolio, which an index doesn't hold. So that might result in 
positive gains versus the index or underperformance versus the index. So we call that intrinsic tracking error. Similarly, uh, an ETF or any fund needs to trade. So for, for client flows, if it's a unit trust, uh, for rebalancing, um, for corporate actions, and if it's a unit trust for reinvesting dividends, if those don't get paid out, uh, like uh, like some of the ETFs uh, do, you know you have to you have to physically go and reinvest those dividends, and that causes uh, to the extent that you don't get the same price at which the index automatically does that, uh, you're going to incur what we call implementation gains or shortfalls. So that's where you're trading at a different price to the theoretical price that the index is dealing with these events. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, well, uh, uh, client flows is something that an index never has to deal with. It never has to deal with real world cash flows. So that's always going to be an impact on your performance, particularly in a unit trust context where you're having to trade for those cash flows on a daily basis. And then uh, whenever you do trade, you're going to incur some form of cost. So those are transaction costs such as uh, securities transfer tax, which uh, applies in our local market. That's 25 basis points on a purchase. Uh, there's brokerage that you pay on that. Uh, it tends to be a much smaller cost than the STT or the securities transfer tax. And there are other statutory trading costs whenever you trade uh, on an exchange to cover things like insider trading levies and uh, straight admin fees, et cetera, uh, which ensures that the whole ecosystem works. So all of these things combined can contribute to tracking error. But you'll notice that the biggest sources of tracking error, particularly, uh, you know, are not the intrinsic tracking error so much, but arise from trading effects, uh, whether it's implementation gains or shortfalls, or the actual costs associated with trading. So just to illustrate here, this is our all share index fund unit trust. And you'll see that, uh, you know, over the last year, the tracking has been incredibly tight, only a three basis point differential. This is before fees. Um, even though we had nine basis points of transaction costs on the unit trust. So you can see that that tracking error has been incredibly tight. Over longer periods, it's been closer to 30 basis points, where about half, if not more of that, has been made up of transaction costs. The rest would be, you know, due to implementation shortfalls or intrinsic tracking error. But, you know, we've worked quite hard over the last few years to try and tighten up uh, the way in which we track. And obviously, as the unit trust grows, it's gotten bigger it becomes easier to keep that tracking error much tighter. Now, if we have a look at our ETF, the Satrix 40 ETF, these are net total returns, so net of the 10 basis points TER, which it's been since uh, 2017. It was slightly higher than that in years prior, um, but it was reduced to 10 basis points in 2017. Um, and so net of that 10 basis points TER, you can see that you're tracking the indexing uh, very, very closely, uh, certainly over the last year, in fact, if you add that 10 basis points of cost back, you are actually ahead of the index on a gross basis. But you also notice how much lower the transaction costs are in the ETF. You're sitting at most at four basis points, whereas if I go back to the all share uh, index fund unit trust, there you're sitting at in excess of 10 basis points. So there is an intrinsically higher cost or transaction cost that you'll find with, uh, with a unit trust relative to an ETF. All right, last issue I'm going to touch on is a dividend tax, and this is particularly relevant when investing uh, offshore. So utilizing a RAND denominated fund, like, a, like an ETF, but getting offshore exposure through that fund. So I just want to explain uh, quickly how that works. Um, firstly, there's a couple of ways in which uh, you can uh, sort of optimize your withholding tax, and it's important to make sure that the fund that you're investing through is doing this. Um, interestingly, South Africa has a double taxation agreement with the US. And so the standard dividend withholding tax rate that applies on US dividends is 30%. So what that means is a company is going to declare a dividend, let's say it's $1 a share that they're paying out. Uh, the US government will withhold uh, 30 cents of that $1 per dividend on, on each share. And so you would only receive 70 cents. But because South Africa has a double taxation agreement with the US, it's possible to reduce that withholding tax rate to 15%. Um, and so now you would get 85 cents of that dividend and not the original, uh, you know, not the full, you know, not the full withholding tax applied and only receiving 70. And you can see within an MSCI world context, how big a share 
the US makes of MSCI World almost uh, just or just below 70 percent. Uh, so it's important that your your you 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 have an efficient uh, means of receiving your dividends, which ultimately influences the total return performance of your global investment strategy when investing offshore. And just uh, I'm not, not going to go too much into the maths, but just to explain this, you know, if you have a look at the dividend yield on on the U.S. at the moment, it's about 1.6 percent. Um, so. You know, if you were only investing in the U.S., you would get, you know, that would be your dividend contribution to your total return. Uh, so the difference between paying 30% on that 1.62% would give you 1.13% contribution to total return, as opposed to only paying 15%, you get 1.38. And so that translates to 24 basis points of additional performance, depending on which uh, withholding tax rate your fund is harvesting. Um, now, if you're tracking MSCI World, obviously the dividend yield is a bit higher, but uh, the US only now makes up 68% of MSCI World. So we're just going to work on this dividend yield within MSCI World. So there it's 1.1% that it contributes. At 15%, that would translate to 94 basis points. At 30%, it would only be 77. So the difference there is 17 basis points. So this is the difference in performance on a total return basis that a fund could deliver depending on whether it's tax efficient or not, whether it's harvesting this lower withholding tax rate or not. Now, the way in which uh, our Satrix feeder ETFs are structured uh, is that they don't actually take advantage of the double taxation agreement between South Africa and the US, but because of the structure and the way the funds they feed into, they also take advantage of that lower 15% withholding tax rate on US dividends. And so they are very tax efficient. And if you look at the performance of our ETFs uh, over a one to three year period, you will see that they are tracking their benchmarks net of fees incredibly tightly. Um, and it's uh, part of the reason for that is because they are optimized from a withholding tax perspective and are very efficient in that regard. So I think I'm gonna end it there. I know we've probably only got about five or so minutes left. Uh, Simon, I'm going to hand back to you, but thank you very much for allowing me to run over a bit. No, Kingsley, that was perfect. And uh, many of the questions that came in, you then subsequently answered. So uh, there's not that many questions left, folks. If you got, we have got a couple of minutes. We've got a couple of questions. If you got some more, uh, drop them in. The, the, the one question, uh, the Pref Tracks ETF is exiting. The question is, are you going to, the Satrix going to step in and make a preference share ETF? My understanding is probably not because liquidity and preference shares are no longer tier one capital. Exactly, and that's that's the reason I understand why that PrefTrax uh, ETF is no longer uh, going to exist because there just isn't a big enough universe to to trade in anymore that makes it viable to invest in. So uh, unfortunately, that's uh, an asset class, for want of a better word, that is uh, leaving our market. And so it doesn't make sense to have a fund investing in it because there just isn't the underlying liquidity available anymore. But there are high yielding mm -hmm. alternatives available. And Satrix does offer some interest bearing strategies, which I mentioned in our taxonomy slides, uh, getting government bonds yields to maturity in excess of 10%. Uh, there's inflation linked bonds offering very healthy real yields in excess of three, if not 4% uh, in excess of inflation. So those are attractive alternatives for clients who are looking primarily for income rather than capital growth. Yeah, uh, and and Diane, you asked the question. Uh, I'm going to uh, on Wednesday next week on the webs on just one lap. I'll have a lot more around that. I'm going to be digging into some of these. Uh, there is of course a tax treatment difference. One paid dividends. The other, the pref shares paid dividends. That was potentially an advantage. Of course, if it's in a tax-free account, it's all moot because you're not paying any tax anyway. Uh, a couple of questions coming through around the ABSI ETFs, and I'm kind of going to merge them together. Um, the first is, are you going to be, you've, you've got some which are patently sort of tracking the same index. Is there potentially going to be some mergers happening? And then the, the other part of the question is, might you even close some of them down? In which case, what would happen to the to the person's investment? Yeah, so there are a, a lot of things on the go at the moment in terms of uh, evaluating those funds. Um, 
investors would obviously receive notification uh, with the prop, you know, with proper advance warning should anything change. I think at a high level, uh, Simon, and for your for your listeners' benefit, yes, where, where there is an obvious overlap, it doesn't make sense for an issuer to have two products effectively offering the same exposure. It creates confusion. Yeah. It gives investors choice that they actually don't, you know, doesn't doesn't add any value because you're effectively getting the same return profile. So in those cases, it would make obvious sense to consolidate uh, or amalgamate. Um, and, and 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 so we're we're working very hard to to make sure that that is uh, as seamless as possible for for investors with the least impact uh, and yeah adverse impact on them. Uh, there are you know there are some strategies which we're evaluating on whether it makes sense to keep those going, and and obviously we will work with the investors in those funds to make sure that we provide them with a suitable alternative should it be decided that those are no longer viable to continue uh, operating yeah. or, or having available on our list. I, I think part of the reason why I also wanted to show the taxonomy to the listeners is just to get Satrix's thinking on how these different strategies mm. fit together. Um, and that, that does guide us to, to a large degree in terms of having a coherent framework within which investors can utilize these different building blocks to achieve different outcomes. And so if there are strategies that um, uh, are you know, under our name, but which don't really fit within that taxonomy, it then, it then starts to raise the question, well, how should investors think about utilizing that particular strategy in line with uh, Satrix's investment philosophy and framework of what they want to offer clients? Question from Pierre, is the market maker automated a robot? And I, I used to make market mating software for, for warrants, options, 20 years ago. Um, we just ran out of Excel. I mean, is it still running out of Excel or they're a little more advanced these days? No, they're uh, quite a bit more advanced. Um, so uh, systems are used uh, to ensure that the, the levels at which bid and offers are made, uh, you know, um, tie up with what's happening on the underlying shares and as the market shifts that you're not inadvertently arbitraging yourself. So there are systems that do that, uh, but obviously it requires human intervention to set the parameters uh, yeah. and to keep an eye on those things. So, so yeah, it's a, it's, it, it, it's a perfect combination of using technology and obviously appropriate risk management uh, around that to, to achieve uh, the desired outcome. Another question coming through, uh, some of your ETFs, I'm thinking most not most recently the RAFI uh, Research Affiliate Fundamental Indexation um, and uh, some of the government bonds, they, they switched from total return to distribution. And the question is, why and how come? And as we chatted around that, uh, Kingsley, a couple of weeks ago, uh, maybe months ago. That was FSCA, really. That, that, that was regulation. Yeah, very much driven by the NAV conduct standard, which is uh, FSCA uh, regulations affecting collective investment schemes of which ETFs form a part. And the, the stipulation there is quite clear that, uh, you know, all collective investment schemes should distribute uh, any income that they generate. They I think the laws are quite clear from both a tax perspective and, and a CIS perspective that, you know, those trusts, which is what they are, can't hold on to that income for longer than 12 months, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not a tax expert. So, so those, those do need to distribute, um, and that's, that's where it came from. Um, we, uh, we are still liaising with, uh, with the FSCA on how to move that forward. Uh, our government bond has changed, but the RAFI one is still to be determined how we solve that. Okay. Uh, folks, we're going to leave that there. Uh, questions are dried up. More importantly, we have hit the time. Uh, Kingsley, really appreciate your time this evening. That was huge fun. Tons to learn, tons to digest. Really in, in, enjoyed that. Uh, and ladies and gents, really appreciate your time attending this evening. Uh, everyone, uh, have a good evening further. Look after yourself. And as always, if you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers, all.